I got a couple of seconds. Uh, I, was, I just started the live feed. Okay. I left my tea inside. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got a couple of seconds. We can keep okay. everybody here. All right, let me go. I'll be right back. All right, man. <laughs> Girls, it's enough. Do, 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 do. <laughs> uh oh, got our second attorney on. What's worse than having an attorney on? Having two. <laughs> really? You know, it's really? even worse than that, having three. <laughs> I see everybody woke up with their sense of humor this morning. Good morning, Daniel. How are you? Flying as frogs here. Really? Uh huh. Excellent. I mean, you look great. It's just amazing. It's like, look. it's like uh, almost as if you're rolling time back every day. Don't give him an ego now, Dan. Don't give him an ego. He doesn't even get bigger now. <laughs> Still a stud. What can I tell you? Uh, truly. <laughs> Did you get our boy taken care of? Uh, working on it. Okay. Do we have a a safe do we have a safe safe space still in here um i don't know who all we are uh live just so you know yeah okay. we're live no all right michael uh, should, someone, should, someone should mute me then <laughs> yeah <laughs> hey okay welcome to this week's legislative update um we'll uh, we'll uh, forego introductions um and uh turn it over to michael to uh, work through the agenda. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the, uh, for those of you who are counting the 48th legislative day. Um, yesterday was the fiscal committee cutoff. So as I go through a few of these bills, I'm gonna pause for a second and uh, talk about the fiscal impacts of a piece of legislation. Um, in the spirit of it being a uh, fiscal cutoff. Um, so that means we have just about 57 days left in the legislative session. So we are just about halfway through, not quite. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of switching the agenda around. I'm kind of going to number three first, and then I'll talk about Blake. Um, as I've talked about on these calls before, um, House of Origin cutoff is March 8th, which is a couple of Wednesdays away. And between now and then will be the House and the Senate will both be conducting largely floor actions to pass uh, the, the, all of the bills that ended up, excuse me, in the respective rule, rules committees. Um, and then once we get patch, past March 8th, any bill that passes from the House to the Senate or vice versa from the Senate to the House um, goes through the same hearing process um, and continues until sine die on Sunday, April 23rd. And then once we get through hearings on the opposite House, we go through the same thing we just went through um, with the uh, House of Origin. We go through policy cutoff, fiscal cutoff, um, opposite House cutoff again. Um, and then the last 10 days um, of the legislative session are basically just co consider opposite house bills, uh, bills that are in dispute and bills necessary to implement the budget. So that's kind of where we are in uh, the process. As I've talked before, remember this is a polling process for the legislature. Uh, somewhere just south of 2,000 bills will get introduced and somewhere south of a couple hundred will be finally adopted by the legislature. Uh, somewhere usually around 10-ish um, percent of the bills that are introduced um, end up uh, getting not only forwarded to the governor, but signed by the governor. So 
Um, with that, I'm going to jump right in and uh, start talking about uh, the Blake bill. Um, and uh, that is Senate Bill 5536. Um, and that's the bill that um, intends to fix the Blake decision. Um, that's been working through the legislature. And that's a really high priority, not only for us, but um, a lot of entities uh, ranging from counties and cities to you know, other law enforcement groups to the business community, um, et cetera. So uh, that bill passed out uh, the Senate Ways and Means Committee um, yesterday. Um, it did pass out as substituted. And I'm gonna talk about just here for a second. Uh, about the five about the five things that were added to it. Uh, you may remember on our last call, we talked about the bill as it came out of uh, the Senate Law and Justice Committee as, you know, what I would characterize as not necessarily a work in progress, but, you know, kind of a, a needle threaded to get enough votes to get it out of um, committee into the Ways and Means Committee. Um, so it was substituted and added a few things, I think, uh, to a lesser degree, they're in Senator Solomon's bill, which remember, remember had the 45 day jail requirement, and then a lot of, um, I'm drawing a blank, a lot of uh, uh, expungement on the back end for those who um, completed treatment. And remember that was something that uh, we didn't support as much as the June Robinson bill, which was more law, law enforcement assisted diversion, pre-prosecution and pre-jail um, uh, emphasis on treatment. So the substitute that was added, that was adopted, that was sponsored by Senator Mullet um, requires, it's made a few changes. Um, requires the forensic lab services um, at the state patrol to complete um, testing of drugs within 45 days. And as you can all guess, that's going to take a pretty significant uh, fiscal impact or uh, expenditure to, to do. Um, it required the sentencing and probation of individuals uh, convicted of possession, meaning those that didn't successfully treat, complete treatment. Um, it requires courts, and in this case, courts of limited jurisdiction, meaning the district and municipal courts, um, for simple possession cases uh, to sentence individuals to no less than 21 days. Um, if the individual does not comply with their um, behavior, health, or substance use disorder treatment as a condition of a uh, probation. Remember, in the Solomon Bill, that was 45 days, so that amount has been uh, lessened. Um, it requires courts to vacate the convictions of simple possession if the, if the individual completes treatment. Um, permits the court um, for the first instance of being sentenced to use its discretion in determining the appropriate amount um, of the individual suspended sentence or reinstate um, or reinstate the sentence if the individual decides uh, or willfully abandons the treatment. Um, again, requires them to reinstate the 21 days of, of a suspended sentence if the individual says they or demonstrates that they can't do treatment. Um, there's one part um, that does maintain the 45 days out of Solomon's bill, and that's on the third um, offense. And if an individual in the third instance is uh, being sentenced under the act is to reinstate on the third time, uh, the 45 days. Um, of, um, of uh, incarceration. And uh, finally, it changed the original bill a little bit and requires that behavioral health providers who provide the treatment uh, in lieu of you know, law enforcement assisted diversion to inform the referring law enforcement agency if the individual violates the term of treatment. So it added back in uh, several of the things that were in the Solomon bill that um, I think from our standpoint um, is, you know, is appropriate. Um, we talked about in our testimony, you know, supporting the Robinson bill. And um, if there is one of the pillars that uh, the legislature could uh, do a little bit more on if they chose to um, was the consequences piece. And this bill clearly does that. Um, I would note that there was not a lot of discussion at the committee, um, which is an interesting 
uh, thing from a from my perspective. A lot of times, you know, um, proposed amendments are debated. This one was not. Um, and I would note that it came out of that committee with a very strong vote. Um, only three Democrats voted no on the bill, which is Senator Monka Ding Monka Dingra, um, Senator Saldana, um, and Senator Bob Hasegawa. So um, that bill comes out with a lot of Democratic support um, and full Republican support. So um, it seems like to me that that's the bill that's got a, you know, a significant chance of moving through the process. Um, I think on the D side of, of the aisle, um, you know, there are some folks in, the, in that uh, caucus that tend a little bit more towards the treatment side, but there are also some more moderate folks within that caucus that uh, tend to a little bit more to the consequences side. So I think the vote coming out of committee is a little bit telling on uh, the strength that this bill has moving forward. Um, now the bill goes to the rules committee and as I mentioned earlier, it's got to pass out of the Senate by two Wednesdays from now on March 8 uh, to still be alive. So um, I'll stop there. Um, oh, and the last thing I'll mention, then I'll stop there. So um, in the spirit of a fiscal cutoff, um, I would just note um, that the fiscal impact of, and this was the, um, uh, the original substitute. So I think it's going to change a little bit. Um, but this had a fiscal impact of $90 million onto the uh, local courts, pretrial diversion, prosecutors, additional cases before courts of um, limited jurisdiction. On the state side, it had on the treatment side, recovery residents, health engagement hubs, and some other things to a tune of about $73 million. And then on the statewide diversion uh, piece of it, which is... Um, uh, jail alternatives to um, uh, incarceration, 23-hour uh, crisis facilities, et cetera, was about $44 million. So all totaled up, the fiscal impact of this bill is about $200 million, give or take. Um, so um, it's great to adopt a policy like this, but at the end of the day, it's the budget writers that get to decide uh, whether or not and how much um, to fund a proposal like this. Um, I will note that uh, the, the cities um, who have municipal and district courts um, and most of the testimony um, on the bill in the Ways and Means Committee, Wayne's and Means Committee was a uh, good bill, good bill, fund it, fund it, fund it, fund it, and fund it. So I think while everybody was okay with the policy, you know, a lot of times the not a lot of times. Sometimes the legislature, you know, creates some policies and in some folks' mind, maybe not fund it or fund the policy to the fullest extent possible. But on this one, across the board, from law enforcement to local government to the treatment folks, um, it, it really was, you got to pay for it. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, again, I expect this bill to, to keep moving along, um, given the, the strong vote coming out of the Ways and Means Committee. So um, and I think it's something that uh, my recommendation would be that we can support moving forward. Um, so with that, I'll stop and see if uh, James, if you want to add any finer points or if there are any questions on the Blake fix bill. I think the only thing I would add is uh, this is kind of exactly what you said. It's going right down the same path we thought we would see a combination of Solomon and Robinson's recommendations from their bills, you know, married up into one bill. So very good job, Michael. Yeah. I got a quick question. Do you know why they chose 21 days instead of 45? Um, I think that's a whole probably an effort to find a middle ground. Um, they do 21 days on the first and second. So again, you're, you know, the consequences increases. Remember, you got a lot of folks, you know, that, that believe in treatment and believe that, you know, people going to jail is not the answer. And treatment in jail especially is not the answer. Um, so I think 21 days on number one and number two is just a good compromise. It's almost half of 45 days. So I'm not I'm not certain specifically, but that would be my guess on why 21 days. OK, thank you. Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to leave uh, agenda item number four, which bills that did not make cut off till the bottom. Uh, James, if that's all right. Yeah, we just want to talk about independent prosecutor a little bit at the end. So save us a little time. Well, that's a bill that's still moving along. So it's a bill that it's a bill that made cut off. So um, and I've got that I've got that down here um, for sure. It's your item number nine. Yep. Yep. Okay. So qualified immunity, House Bill 1025, a bill that uh, us, the other law enforcement groups and cities and counties, well, I think counties have decided to um, stay out of this, uh, this bill for now, I heard. But this is the qualified immunity bill, uh, Representative Ty. Um, it passed out of the House Appropriations Committee uh, day before yesterday on a party line vote. Um, the no votes uh, were, you know, the same things that we've talked about um, in terms of qualified immunity. Um, and uh, uh, on the D side, you know, they believe it's something that needs to be done um, and do it's and there needs to be a replication um, of qualified immunity um, in the at the state level um, as opposed to the federal level. So. Um, We'll keep working um, in opposition to this. Um, I have uh, talked to some other folks, and we're thinking about if this is if this bill is an opportunity for a joint, what I would call the joint letter to the legislature, um, which is where some law enforcement groups and maybe some cities and counties and some of the insurance folks might be able to. And by insurance folks, I mean the folks that insure uh, public agencies can get together and collaborate on a common communication to the legislature um, rather than us all continuing to do our own thing. Um, as you probably know, in the legislature, there's comfort in numbers. Um, so if a lot of groups can get together with one message, um, it really is a little bit more powerful from a legislative standpoint. I don't think this is a piece of legislation where um, my words where you can slice it and dice it. Um, you know, a lot of legislation that's out there may have, you know, let's say 10 things in it. And, you know, there are times in the legislative process where um, folks will say, if you remove these three things out of that 10, uh, we'll be neutral on the bill and won't oppose it any longer. It doesn't mean we'll, we like it. Um, it doesn't mean we're going to support it, uh, but it means it puts us in a place of neutrality and you know, a place where uh, we'll stand down on a piece of legislation. So um, I don't think this bill um, can be sliced and diced in that fashion. Um, so again, if this was something we'll continue to oppose. And as I mentioned um, earlier, it's got to pass out of the House of Origin um, by two Wednesdays from now. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. The fiscal note on that one is pretty small. Um, you know, and I think indeterminate on the, the local government side, um, just because you don't know how many of these things, how many, you know, these cases are going to be had and, and how many of these cases ultimately get uh, settled, as you all know, very few of them, at least of late, uh, have been going to trial and local governments have been settling out um, a lot recently and not taking these things to trial. So um, with that, Chief, I'll stop and see if there's any other comments in the chat or questions in the chat on House Bill 1025. Nope, good to go. Okay. By the way, thank you for letting me go in and get my tea. <laughs> All right, the next bill is House Bill 1445. Um, that's the Patterns and Practices Bill um, of Representative Hansen. Um, that we support um, that passed out also two days ago out of the House Appropriations Committee, um, also um, on a party line vote. Um, that bill um, uh, does have um, some fiscal impacts to it. And remember that's the bill that um, focuses quite a bit on uh, patterns and practices at the local agency level. Um, and authorizes the attorney general the ability to get into those um, agencies where those patterns and practices are 
um, evident and allows the attorney general to authorize some model policies um, on accountability and things like that. So um, the, the fiscal impact on that on the attorney general's office side was about $3.5 million in the 2023-25 biennium um, and about $3.5 million per biennium moving forward. So over the next six years, about a $10.5 million impact. And as you can probably guess, that's um, uh, about hiring staff. Um, remember when bills like this get implemented, um, a lot of times the legislature does not authorize a full boat um, of a fiscal impact, meaning um, it may take time to get equipment, it may take time to hire folks. And those of you who you know, know budget stuff um, know this, that a lot of times there can be a delay in implementation or a delay in hiring. Um, so that's something that I fully expect um, on this bill moving forward. So I'll stop on 1445 again, James, and see if there are any questions uh, or comments in the uh, uh, the chat. Nope. Okay. All right. The next sort of uh, cadre of bills I'll, th I'll put in here are uh, bills related to vehicular pursuits. Excuse me. Um, I'll start with House Bill 1363, um, which is the rule, uh, Representative Alicia Rule Bill um, that passed out of the Community Safety and Reentry Committee, um, gosh, a week or so ago. Um, that bill um, is moving forward. Um, it passed out of the Transportation Committee uh, day before yesterday. Um, I would note that, uh, and, and James, correct me on any of this, this bill, as in its current form, basically authorizes pursuits under the reasonable suspicion standard for everything but property crimes. Um, so all the assaults are put back in, reasonable suspicion is put back in. And so um, uh, that's where that bill sits right now um, in terms of its substance. I would note that there was a Republican amendment um, to take, I'm gonna say take it back, but to allow vehicular pursuits under the reasonable suspicion for all crimes. And I'll just say it this way, that would take the bill all the way back to pre-1054 um, and that amendment failed um, on a party line vote. Um, at the end of the day, um, the way that bill sits as I just described it, it did pass out, but it also had some de no votes uh, moving out of committee. It had five of them, which is significant. Um, reps Barry Dolio, Entman, Mena, and Taylor um, all voted no on that, um, that bill moving out of committee. So um, unlike, uh, unlike 5536, um, the way a, a lobbyist would put it is that bill came out of committee a little bit on the stinky side meaning it had some significant no votes to it, which means it's gonna get a little bit stronger scrutiny by the majority party as it moves um, into the rules committee um, and onto the floor for a potential vote. There are probably other members of that caucus who of the Democratic caucus who weren't in the transportation committee that would share the views of the folks who voted no on uh, 1363. And James, um, I think I shipped to you and Marco, and I don't know how widely it was distributed, um, but I think if folks want a sense as to why um, some folks on the D side are voting no on this legislation, it's that op-ed that uh, Rep. Mena and Senator Trudeau did. Um, I think it was in the news. I heard it was in the News Tribune this past week, um, but it was in the Bellingham Herald the week before. And so um, I'd encourage folks to ping that op-ed and give it a look. Um, there's a lot of things in that op-ed that we, we talk a lot about while we're on the Hill, um, which is uh, data-driven decisions, not politically-driven decisions. And so that op-ed talks a lot about the data being all over the board um, and their, vote, their no vote was because they wanted the work group uh, to get together and figure out what the data really is out there in terms of vehicular pursuits. 
um, and what's right and what's wrong. I will tell you that the recent report out of the Pierce County Sheriff's Office has not done anybody any favors in terms of pursuits. Um, so I expect um, this bill to move forward in conjunction with uh, House Bill 1586 that I'm going to talk about um, here in a second. So James, uh, you want anything to add on 1363? Anything in the chat? Any questions on, for anybody? I'm, I'm going to save my comments till you get done with the next one, the working okay. group. All right. So um, the next bill um, is House Bill 1586. And remember, that's the piece of legislation that um, creates a vehicular pursuit pursuit working group at the CJTC, um, a la our canine process that we did a couple of years ago, and also creates the grant program on technology for vehicular pursuits that's contained in the, contained in the bill. And uh, the grant program talks a lot about uh, use of things like ALPRs, uh, drones, and global positioning or GPS uh, tracking systems. Um, and I forget the name of the company, but it's the dart that can be popped onto a car um, from a vehicular pursuit uh, perspective. Um, uh, there's a, a story out there. There's a, a place down in California, just out of sight of San Diego that has uh, four drones up and running 24 seven, 365. They have uh, four nests around their community. Um, and every time there's a 911 call that comes in, and if appropriate, one of the drones goes up um, and is actually usually at the scene within two to three minutes, whereas officer time can be somewhere in the 10-ish uh, minute range. And so it uh, certainly provides having those drones about certainly provides for some additional officer awareness and situational awareness before uh, peace officers get to a scene. And they've saved some money down there because a lot of uh, the, you know, the 911 calls end up being for not. Um, and so uh, peace officers can be called off and be off doing something else. So um, those two bills, um, House Bill 1363 and House Bill 1586, um, I think you know, James and Mines' wisdom after talking with a few legislators is, is you know, for, book, for the vehicular pursuit bill to move forward for the folks in the D side of the aisle that are a little bit more on the progressive side can move forward, but it has to move forward in conjunction with the grant program and um, the work group. So, um, and I think that's, from my perspective, that seems like a, a pretty decent middle ground in terms of, you know, having the folks who really want to make vehicular pursuits more discretionary on a peace officer's side, while at the same time making certain that the data group and the grant program goes forward. So those bills together, um, I think if we can keep them attached at the hip um, are a really good you know, solution that my recommendation is, is that we, the FOP could get behind. Um, the last thing I'll mention on House Bill 1363, uh, for that bill to move, there was a sunset clause placed on it. Um, and that's a little bit more um, from the, you know, the progressive side of the D caucus. And that bill is going to sunset in July of 2025. So what that does is that get, puts sort of the legislature on the hook, number one, to do something um, in uh, the 24 or the 25 session. And at the same time, allows the work group and the grant program to get stood up and move along um, at the same time. So, um, you know, my recommendation on this is that we support having both of those bills attached at the hip and move forward together, um, because I think that is, I think that's the best chance that uh, the vehicular pursuit betterment bill. Um, has a chance of moving forward. I think if it gets over to the Senate all by itself, um, Senator Dingra has been pretty clear um, in her position on vehicular pursuits. And she is, uh, you know, I think more centered around getting some better information and some more data before moving forward. Um, so I think the having the vehicular pursuit move forward, those changes has a much better chance if that um, House Bill 1586 moves along with it. 
So with that, James, I'll stop. I know that's a mouthful, um, and I'm happy to you know answer any questions or hear if you got yeah. anything to add. Nope, he did a very good job for me. Uh, if you didn't pick up Michael's hand, messaging, I'm going to be clear. Uh, we want these two bills to move together. When you talk to people, you talk to other members, you talk to our legislators, your legislators in your district, these two bills are essential. They need to move together. Uh, barring them getting merged into one big uh, bill, uh, this is the best case scenario. Everything that Michael said, I agree with 110%. But um, in order for both of them to uh, be successful, more so pursuits, they need to go together. That being said, um, you know, uh, uh, messaging is so important, right? You don't want to pay uh, people into corners with the message that you deliver, um, you know, in a negative way, because it'll, it will always come back to bite you. So thank you again, Michael, for a very good explanation. Yeah. Steve, if I can give uh, just one quick uh, comment. You know, I know that how, how that we've uh, spoke about these bills, you know, in depth on our Tuesday morning meetings, um, you know, and we've actually testified to both in favor um, in the past, um, you know, uh, so I, there's no reason why we should change that path at this point, especially with this information that we have. We can continue to, to push forward supporting both and, uh, and hopefully it gets across the finish line. Yeah, and before I forget, uh, James and Marco, for you two, let's make certain that we uh, get together with David and Jocelyn and figure out something for these two bills. Okay, great. Um, the last one I'll, I'll, uh, I'll submit in here is Senate Bill 5533, um, and that's Senator Lubbock's um, bill that does the same thing as House Bill uh, 1586, which is the study group. And the grant program, um, I would note that that bill did not pass out of the Ways and Means Committee yesterday. Um, and if I'm going to read my tea leaves, um, that is um, yet another indication of the Senate looking to the House and saying, you have the two bills that need to come over for us to consider. Um, they, you know, I think from my perspective, they need to come together. Um, and so that bill 5533 um, was not considered. And as everybody knows, John Lovick um, was our legislator of the year. And um, while his bill may not be moving forward, he stands to have a lot of credit given to him for working that bill um, through at least uh, the Law and Justice Committee and the uh, Ways and Means Committee process. All right, so nothing else on vehicular pursuits. I'm gonna kind of move on to House Bill 1513. Um, and that is the non-moving violation uh, piece of legislation that did pass out uh, the Transportation Committee day before yesterday on a party line vote. Um, uh, Chief Shrimpshire and I have uh, had some conversations with the prime sponsor and uh, we keep talking about uh, data, a data-driven decision. Um, the data on uh, non-moving violations is um, really all over the board. Um, so we think there needs to be a little bit more data before um, this bill moves forward. One of the things we did note um, with Representative Street is, you know, there's a number thrown around that, you know, out of the 11 million stops from the state patrol that happened over, I think it's 2000 and eh, it's a 10 year period. And I think it went up to about 2019 is the most recent data out of the 11 million uh, traffic stops, non-moving violation stops that they made, 0.27% resulted in getting contraband or finding something else as a result of that non-moving violation. Um, and while 0.27 sounds like a really small number, 0.27% of 11 million is 29,700 instances uh, where extra contraband uh, was picked up. So from our perspective, there's, you know, there's some data on the other side um, of things being uh, 
of criminals and crimes being had as a result of a new non-moving violation stop. What we don't know is whether that was, you know, firearms, drugs, you know, a hash pipe or whatever it was, or a meth pipe. So um, we don't know how that 29,700 breaks down, but if this bill does move forward, you know, that's a point that we'll continue to make that, you know, while 0.27% is probably a small number, it does represent 29,700, uh, you know, crimes that resulted from non-moving violations. So um, we're gonna continue. Uh, Representative Street is just uh, a really great guy and really good to work with um, and really smart about uh, the data on um, non-moving violations, but we're gonna continue to uh, work with him as that bill moves forward. And as we mentioned, you know, last week, that's just a bill that we're, you know, quietly opposed to. And uh, think that there needs to be some more data gotten before the bill moves forward. So. On the fiscal note um, on that, that bill, um, it's significant. Uh, State Patrol um, has about 30 FTEs that they're looking at. They believe that uh, dispatch calls will um, increase. So a total um, of about uh, $8.7 million fiscal impact to the state uh, per biennium moving forward. And that's uh, about 30 new FTEs, largely on the dispatch side. Um, on the local government side, I was a little surprised. Their fiscal impact per biennium was only about $1.1 million. So I think that's a little conservative on that from their standpoint. Um, but um, putting together local government fiscal notes is just a ginormous challenge because as everybody knows, there are 279 cities how many um, universities that have their own police forces, port police forces um, and the like. So, um, you know, there's there's a note always in these local government fiscal uh, impacts that said, uh, in addition to the estimate above, there are additional indeterminate costs. Um, so, uh, so it's just, you know, something that um, they've kind of tried to put a bow around, um, but really just haven't, uh, gotten a really great perspective on how much it's really going to cost them. So um, I'll stop there and see if there are um, any uh, thing is there's anything you want to add, James, on uh, 1513. No, you did a good job with the data. Uh, what I will add to be clear and to be fair, there is a data component to the bill. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, already. Uh, it would require that we all adopt the Washington State Patrol traffic stop form that the troopers fill out every time they make a traffic stop. Um, we suggested a different form, maybe something that could be incorporated into a um, electronic ticketing system. Um, that being said, um, uh, I agree with what Michael said, that uh, the physical note is quite large. I would also add that, Michael, um, this is easier uh, to track than what they are letting on because there's only so many dispatch centers in the state. And maybe we reach out to our friends at the, you know, the telecommunicators and they would be able to give us a better physical note for the local uh, jurisdictions. So we're going to continue to monitor this bill uh, as it goes, um, but we have been working quiet. When we say quietly, we're not out poking people in the eye. We're just doing the hard work. Michael's taking on the yeoman share of that, but we're rolling up our sleeves, communicating to people one on one and taking those small meetings. So that's all I got. All right. Any other questions on that one? All right. Uh, House Bill 1579, statewide independent prosecutor. Um, also a bill that we continue to oppose. It passed out yesterday um, on a party line vote um, in the House Appropriations Committee. Um, again, something we're, we're just not supportive of as we've talked on these calls for the reasons we've already talked about. Um, it's placed in you know, the Attorney General's office, keeps local prosecutors in line and kind of what I would call in the driver's seat, um, which is something that uh, we are just you know, flat not supportive of. Um, what I will also tell you, and again, in the spirit of the Appropriations Committee and fiscal cutoff, um, this bill has a significant fiscal impact, um, I think, as we all knew, um, on the Attorney General's office. Um, 
$21.5 million um, in each biennium moving forward. And I take that back in 20. $1.8 million in 23, 25, and, or 25, 27, and 27, 29 biennia. Um, the Attorney General's testimony um, was fund it, fund it, and fund it. Um, and they actually asked for, and it did have one amendment on it before it passed out. And that extends the implementation date to, I think, it extends the implementation date a year to give the AG's office time to catch up with staffing. Uh, I would note that they estimate that they are going to have to hire 56.2 um, new uh, individuals to run this uh, Office of Independent Prosecution. So it's a big fiscal note. It's a big hire. Um, and it's something that, you know, we're going to continue to watch and to continue to, you know, be opposed to and you know, James, if it, as it gets delayed and as it gets moved out farther for implementation, um, I think it, you know, fits into our idea that, you know, maybe that because this governor isn't interested in housing the Office of Independent Prosecution, that maybe that delay in impact, that delay in implementation provides us an opportunity um, to hold this bill back a little bit and see if we can get it into a place where um, maybe the governor might sign it. Um, so I'll stop there and see if there are any questions on uh, 1579. Hey, so Michael, before we move forward with 1579, uh, there's been some questions from members. Uh, because of that, we asked Dan uh, Danell, one of our attorneys that responds to OIS scenes. Uh, and before I, uh, I turn it over to him, I just... Uh, Remember that the FOP is the only law enforcement group in the state of Washington that has attorneys that respond to these scenes. Others can find private attorneys, but we're the only ones that have people that respond to the scene uh, that are not a third party vendor. That being said, um, you know, there's been some questions from members. Why do we why in the past did we support independent prosecutor? Well, we support an independent prosecutor for a couple of reasons. One, it brings consistency to the world. Uh, two, it allows um, us to better prepare our members for when and if that time occurs. And so I wanted to bring Dan on, who's one of those attorneys that has to deal with 39 different prosecutors and how they handle a, a deadly force encounter by law enforcement. So with that, Dan, feel free to take it over, buddy. Um, thanks, Chief. Um, <clears throat> what I'm seeing in shooting scenes across different counties right now is a piecemeal approach to what officers have access to before they give their statements. We have counties where people are being pressured to give statements immediately at the scene, which is contrary to not only constitutional protections, but also collective bargaining agreements. Some of that pressure is coming from within their own agencies and associations, which is just stunning to me. What is most concerning to me is the inconsistency in which counties are allowing officers to watch their body camera footage prior to giving a voluntary statement if they choose to do so or write a voluntary written statement in lieu of a personal statement for an SIU team investigating the potential use of force or the potential criminality of the use of force. Um, I think there are significant legal um, implications and a broad spectrum of concerning legal liability that arises when on a piecemeal approach, prosecutors are not allowing officers to watch their body camera video. I have responded to dozens and dozens of shootings in the last four or five years. And almost every single one of those, there are going to be stress caused and anxiety caused and adrenaline caused inconsistencies with an officer's recollection and um, details of video. I think you're setting officers and agencies and supervisors up 
for legal liability by forcing potential inconsistencies into a shooting investigation. You are raising civil liability for the agencies and the officers. You're risking criminal liability. You're risking Brady liability. And you're risking jeopardizing a criminal case against a potential suspect because an officer may have some inconsistencies between their recollection immediately upon a shooting and video. I think it's horrible, horrible policy that some of these prosecuting attorneys are instilling. We are pushing back. We are trying to explain this from a respectful standpoint about where these legal problems are rising and trying to change this. Um, however, that's very difficult doing it 39 separate times in separate counties. Thanks, Dan. So uh, uh, as you just heard, this is the person that responds, that represents, and uh, for us, it makes a whole lot of sense if we were to bring the consistency to the world and our attorneys dealt with one agency or one entity on every deadly force encounter. So, uh, you know, the FOP takes a lot of hits for our positions, but we don't just take a position to take it or because uh, uh, ideological reasons. We take it because we've done the research, we've done the homework, we have smart people like Dan and Michael working for us, and they do a very good job of, of, of guiding us in the right direction. So, um, Marco, before we move on, do you want to say anything? Yes, I appreciate it. And I think, uh, uh, you know, Dan, thank you for, uh, for giving that insight. And obviously, you know, um, like Michael mentioned, you know, this, uh, you know, bill that is uh, the current draft of the bill is something that we we're not we can't get behind. Uh, but previous ones, yes, we have because it, it kept it as a an independent um, body um, away from the attorney general's office, which is something that we do support. And so um, we're hope, hopeful we'll just continue to go forward trying to give our our um, you know our two cents on on why we have the positions we have the positions with. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're hopeful that, uh, you know, uh, legislators will, will listen to our, uh, you know, our comments on that. Thanks, Marco. Michael, you got any closing thoughts before we go around the room? Yeah, just give me a couple of seconds. I'm just going to, so um, for you two and the lodge presidents who get um, the tracking list, um, the tracking list is going to come out this weekend. and. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put all of the dead bills, meaning the bills that didn't pass out of the policy committee by the, by the appropriate time and the bills that didn't pass out of the money committees yesterday. I'm going to put them all the way down at the bottom um, of the report. So you'll see a very, very long list of bills at the bottom and the bills that died um, with one big caveat. Can everybody say NTIB? Um, so you have those bills down at the bottom, but uh, sometimes they can get back alive. So um, sometimes you may see a bill that looks dead that's up above. Um, and the reason is, is, you know, we feel that it's going to be necessary to implement the budget. And then I'm going to run that report, uh, James and Marco, I think twice. So on two reports, you'll see dead bills. And then after that, I'm going to move the dead bills completely off of the report. So the report won't be 22 pages. It'll probably be about 10 pages. Um, and then I'm just going to quick mention a couple of other bills. You know, those are our high priorities, the ones that we're really working on. Um, but I also want to mention just a few other ones that uh, we're supportive of or opposed to that are also moving along through the process. Um, House Bill 1055, which is the public safety the 911 operators moving into from PERS into the public PSERS, that's moving forward. Um, the bill that uh, James has uh, spent a lot, little bit of time on, um, creating a missing and murdered Indigenous woman um, and people cold case unit within the AG is one that uh, continues to move forward. Um, House Bill 1290, which we supported um, with regard to tribal police training at the CJTC is also moving forward. Um, Marco, regrettably, I think Homes for Heroes did not make it out of capital budget. 
um, on Thursday, and that's House Bill 1633. Um, I'm going to double check that, but that's what the report is showing now. So that's um, unfortunate. Um, Senator Braun's bill um, concerning an enhanced uh, penalty for assault of an off duty police officer is moving forward. So that's a good thing. Um, Senator Lubbock's flexible work hours for peace officers is also a bill that we've spent some time supporting um, that's also moving forward. So that's a good thing. Um, our military service credit bill, remember that's the bill that uh, clarifies interruptive military service and allows folks to maintain uh, their retirement system stuff. Uh, House Bill 10, 1007 um, is also moving forward. Um, there's a bill that we've supported 1200 that creates a privilege uh, between an employee and their union representative. That's something that uh, is moving forward. Um, there's the Ramos bill that uh, was going to create um, a general pool of folks at the CJTC um, that was going to be not that, that pool or cohort was going to be state backed versus local backed. And remember that uh, bill regrettably uh, had the substance of it uh, moved out. Um, and then um, just maintained it as a study. So the CJT is going to look and see how that works. I think there were some HR things and some sponsorship things that the CJTC just wasn't sure about. And Rep Ramos was uh, really gracious uh, and saying, yeah, um, I get that. And we'll just go ahead and study it moving forward. Um, Let's see, I got the tribal police training. Um, I would note um, the 23 hour crisis relief center bill or Senate bill 5120 is also moving forward. That's a bill that uh, we signed up in favor of. And uh, this is a bill that we create, creates uh, crisis relief centers. Um, and in full disclosure is a, another client of mine that has some facilities down in uh, Arizona, both of which have fabulous relationships with their law enforcement community. Um, and in, in these types of centers, uh, law enforcement drop-offs are allowed 24-7, 365. And law enforcement uh, agencies and peace officers are basically out and back on the street within five to 10 minutes. So it's a quick drop-off. It's not taking them to jail. It's not taking folks who are having a behavioral health episode to uh, an ER. Um, it's a really good spot. Um, for folks to get behavioral health treatment. And so I'm, we're hopeful that um, that model in Arizona can be repeated up here with the same level of law enforcement support as we have down there. Um, the last one I will uh, mention is Senate Bill 5606. Um, and that's a bill that's related to illegal street racing and has some enhanced penalties, both on the arrest side, the bystander side and the impoundment side. Um, and the penalty side. So that's a bill that uh, we're also supportive of. And it uh, is on, passed out a committee with, I don't think any no votes. And so it's what's on um, uh, the second reading calendar in the Senate and expect that bill to move forward over to the House after uh, we get through a couple of uh, about 10 days in floor action. So I will stop there. And as always, thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, sorry to be so winded, but I hope this information is helpful. Uh, thank you, Michael. It's always helpful. And I know working with you all the time, how hard you work for us and, and uh, your insight and how we get things done is much appreciated. So Appreciate that. With that, I'll go around the room. Uh, top of my list is uh, Jack Symington, our national trustee. You got anything to add? Nope, just listening, uh, thinking Michael doing a great job. Um, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Thank great you, to be Jeff. retired, great to be in the sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Holt, you're next. You got anything? No, nope. thank you, guys. All right. Uh, Chad, you have anything? Nope, appreciate it as always. Jeff? No, I'm all good. Thanks, guys. Okay, Dan, you got any parting words? And thank you again for showing up. Much appreciated. 
Thank you for inviting me. I have nothing else. Okay, Marco, you got anything before I close this up? Yes, again, uh, Michael, your rock star as usual. James, thanks for uh, you know the informative update. <clears throat> and just to just to add a little bit, you know, um, you know, uh, James, I mentioned it a little bit before. You know that uh, we we can take some heat sometimes, but know that as as a law enforcement organization that that is a member driven organization, we have people on this call, uh, people on our calls on Tuesdays, um, who put a lot of thought and effort into the, the how we proceed with uh, specific uh, bills, and uh, and and they represent uh, areas from all over the state. Um, you know, so yeah, you know what we we may take some parting shots from uh, our stakeholders sometimes, and that's going to happen. But we are always going to work and do what, what we can to uh, to move forward in this new way of policing that we are experiencing and try to find some some areas that we can uh, progress in and make sure that we have the protections we need uh, to do our jobs. That's what we're here for. And we we uh, we will continue to do that, even if it's uh, with uh, through our own unique voice. We will do that each and every time. So thank you. Well, uh, that's the legislative update for this week. Uh, my only parting words are, um, you know, the proof, my old grandma used to say the proof's in the pudding. Uh, we are the fastest growing law enforcement organization in the Northwest. That's doing a lot of part by a lot of smart people we have uh, running, the, running the operation. That being said, uh, we're, we're growing so fast. I think it's time, you you know, we let people know how, 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 uh, how big we are so uh all of you that are listening out on social media uh, please take the time to reach out to your legislators let them know that you're fop and you support the fop um and uh thank you and we'll see you again next week remember you can catch the reruns on our youtube channel wafop tv and uh on facebook so see you guys next week thanks everybody